If I was to ask you where do you think the largest earthen mound is located in the Western Hemisphere, you probably would think Central or South America. But what if I told you it was actually in the Midwest? Those group of states that you fly over to get to the other parts of the states that actually matter? Why is it so important and how do you get UNESCO World Heritage status? Cokie is located in Illinois, just about 16 kilometers outside of St. Louis. But what makes it so important? Well, it was first settled around 700 CE, but it didn't take off until 950 CE. At its max population, it's thought to have been anywhere from 8,000 to 40,000 people. And I know that is a huge gap in those numbers. The problem is they didn't leave behind a written language. What they did leave behind is material culture. So we use that. We take and we study the amount of animal bones that they left behind. We study the amount of broken pottery that they left behind. And we try to take and calculate an estimate for how many people live there. It's not perfect, but it's what we got. If Kokia's population was so massive, why did they only last from about 950 CE to 1350 CE? Well, simply enough, the answer is complicated. We think that it might have been due to deforestation and over farming, but there's other answers. Disease, social stress, warfare. We just really don't know. Kokia was part of the Mississippi culture. The Mississippi culture stretched all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes. They started sometime between 700 to 900 CE, we're not quite certain, and they lasted all the way up to European colonization. They were defined by the pottery that they made and the mounds they constructed. What makes Kokia so fascinating? Well, it's all because of one mound they constructed called Monk's Mound. That's what we call it. They probably called it something else. Monk's Mound is absolutely massive. That's what she said. It's about 30 meters high and covers about 14 acres. Monk's Mound was constructed of clay and dirt, and it all had to be transported by hand. It took nearly 700,000 cubic meters of dirt just to construct this mound. There's even evidence that there was a structure on top of the mound, and this structure was huge. It was about 30 and a half meters long by 15 meters wide, and about 15 and a quarter meters high. Monk's Mound was constructed sometime between 900 to 1200 CE, but this isn't the only mound. Originally, there was about 120 mounds stretching 16 square kilometers. Now there's only about 70, and this is due to housing development, roads, you know, just us doing us stuff. Tokyo was divided into three main areas. The first being administrative and ceremonial, so think Monk's Mound. The second were elite compounds, that one's pretty self-explanatory. And the third was where everybody else lived. This was the residential, they even had suburbs. Each of the districts were actually orientated to a cardinal direction. Most of the people living in Kokia were farmers. They had to farm maize on a huge scale just to support that massive population. This brings us to Jin. Jin wanted to be 20 years old. But she actually had a date that she wanted to go back to, and this is uncommon because during prehistory we don't have much of the way of dates to go off of. There was no written language. But in 1054 there was an event that affected the whole world. In 1054, a supernova lit up the sky. And we know this because other cultures around the world had already developed a written language. We see reports from China, from Japan, and Arabic literature. And there's even a possible cave painting in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico depicting this. The supernova lasted during the daytime for 23 days, and at night it was visible for almost two years. So what would have Jin's life actually been like? Well, pretty repetitive. She would have had to take and tend to the crops most of the time. They grew things like corn, squash, and sunflowers. Those are only just a few of the things that she would have had to grow. And she would have had to take and done this more and more each year as the population continued to grow. Most of the population that lived in Kokia weren't from there. They were actually immigrants, and Jin would have been living here during its boom time. Tim Packett is an archaeologist that has spent his career studying Kokia, and he believes that the leaders actually used the supernova 1054 to help drive the population growth. Now this isn't to say that all of her time would be spent farming. Occasionally they would clear out the Grand Plaza so they could play a game called Chunky. Chunky is nothing more than taking a stone disc and rolling it across the ground, and spear throwers trying to get as close to hitting the disc as possible. So think of a mixture between lawn darts and bocce ball. This would have been a great way for people to come together and even take and trade and gamble a little bit. But Kokia also loved to party, and we can tell this because they left behind these midden piles. Midden piles are nothing more than trash heaps. In these trash heaps, we find a lot of burnt bones and broken dishes. They would feast on deer, bison, squirrels, and swans. People would travel from all over to attend these parties. And we know this because of a drink they had. It's called the black drink. And I know it's not a very inventive name, but it's what we got to work with. But the black drink is made of holly trees. And holly trees don't grow anywhere near Kokia. They're from hundreds of miles away. So people would have to bring these holly trees with them just to take and ingest this drink. So what purpose did the mounds serve? Well, they were used for burials. The most famous of which is Mound 72 and they found around 270 individuals. One burial in particular stands out, known as the Beaded Burial. This was one guy thought to be a leader. He was buried on top of a platform of 20,000 shell beads. Recently, archaeologists have actually gone back and re-looked at the records, and they're starting to question some of the theories that those archaeologists put forward. 
They're saying that maybe that they were just a little bit biased and that this wasn't warfare. This might have just been something that they did and that they were biased because they were looking at events that were happening in the southeast hundreds of years after the events of Kokia and saying that, well, that was warfare, so this had to be warfare as well. Kokia is too often forgotten about. And this could be because it's in a part of the United States that not many people care about, or they just don't know it exists. It could also be because the findings there aren't as shiny as the other parts of the Americas. But the archaeologists going back and re-looking at the records is something that needs to happen everywhere. The records back then were probably biased by the time period that they're in, just the same way they're going to be biased by the time period we're in, and future archaeologists will need to go back and re-look at our records. This is something that just needs to happen. On a personal note, Kokia is actually very important to me. When I was first deciding if I was going to become an archaeologist, Megan and I made a couple trips out there, and I love Kokia. It's an amazing place. There's something spectacular about standing on top of Monk's Mound, looking out and seeing the St. Louis Arch. This huge mound of dirt, just looking out and seeing a huge thing of steel. It's just kind of surreal. So if you ever do find yourself in St. Louis and you got a little bit of time to kill, Go to Kokia, pack a picnic, make a day of it. It is well worth your time. I want to thank you all for watching and I want to thank the patrons. Just think, that mound of dirt that you've been working on for years, I don't know, you might be doing, I don't know your life. It might actually be an archaeological site in the future.